Hey guys, welcome to the most exciting episode I've ever done, just like every episode I've ever done. Now, it's been a really long week for me, and there's been guitars coming and going one right after the other. Some of them I've had for a couple hours, some of them a couple days at the most, but there's a steady stream of guitars going in and out, in and out. And the people that know me see the guitars I have, and they're looking at these guitars, and sometimes, like in fact, a lot of times, I see something in their eyes, and it's not like, oh, that's a nice guitar. It's more like coveting. And um, I've tried to make you all aware of what coveting is, is and the dangers of it. In fact, I give a lot of attention to my responsibility and I'm talking about a big responsibility this kind of responsibility to make sure you understand the dangers of coveting you yeah the rest of you yeah yeah but not so much as you yeah I'm talking to you you know so I got to thinking all this coveting there's a lot of it around me and it hit me I might be the cause of the coveting it's plausible, but pretty much relatively unlinear. Re unlinearly relative. Yeah, anyway, something like that. And I started thinking, what about me would make people covet me? And then it hit me. Is it the fact that they patterned the Ken doll after me? Is it that I'm the inventor of Chick Flick Teal? Um, is it my guitars being on the covers of record albums? Or is it something inherent to me that I can't help, like talent? Like, is it the Gibson Lap Steel Jump Pile? Is it the California Jump Pile? Is it the Texas junk pile, is it the Mr. Airplane Man cigar box guitar? Or is it just some of these other ones I haven't touched yet? Like this old arch top here, or this Patrician from the 40s? I see it. Stop. Don't do it. Is it my collection of Camacho boxes? Hey, Michael Breedlove, I love that body. Don't worry, I'll get to it. Is it my collection of license plates? Maybe the black and gold original California license plates, not the one that they just came out with. Is it my collection of Mississippi license? Oh, look at that one. Maybe it's my Mississippi license plates. Maybe it's my coffee cans. My plethora of coffee cans. Is it the coffee can guitar that's signed by virtually everyone in the blues world? Is it my picture of Mrs. Olson? Maybe it's my award-winning vocabulary? Maybe it's that stuff I got on the bottom shelf that you don't even know about yet? You don't need to worry about that. You need to worry about this right here, Padna. Is it my blues book library? So, it hit me. All those things are real, but I cannot be the only one that's coveted. Really? There's got to be other people out there. So I had an idea. I thought, I got a lot of subscribers, like a few thousand now. And out there, amongst my subscribers, there's got to be people like me that share my pain and the loneliness that goes with other people don't like you. They just want what you got. So, I decided I'm going to open the door. And I'm going to call the episode Coveter's Corner. And... Some of my subscribers are going to send me in footage 
something that shows something that they have that is something that coveters just can't help themselves. Now, if you're going to be one of these people to send me your idea, here's what I need. Do not shoot your footage in this format, like an iPhone. I don't like these, whatever this is over here. You have to shoot it like this, like the format you're watching right now, unless you're laying on your couch watching me. If you're doing that, you don't need to watch me sideways. You don't get the full effect of all of this. Sit up, wash your face, get a job, and turn your camera, not like this, but like this. And you're going to send me footage showing me something you have. Could be an archtop guitar, could be a cigar box, could be a license plate, could be anything but do not ever send me something made out of a bedpan or a toilet seat that's just a crappy idea that I will not support on my channel I have a minimum standard here what yeah no don't do that I'll pray for you son but yeah you're gonna send me your stuff and you might get on Coveter's Corner now if you get an episode of Cup. Coveter's Corner, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to send you a care package and you're going to be so happy that you're alive. And this will just add to people coveting you. But anyway, it just goes with the business. Now, the first guest on Coveter's Corner is a dude named Drew out of Washington, D.C. He got a hold of me and asked me a couple questions. We had a nice, intelligent conversation. Do you know what an intelligent conversation is? Well, that's all right. We'll help you with that on this channel. Anyway, I'm going to turn this over to Drew now, and he is going to talk about something that you are just going to die for. We're all going to pray for you. We're going to light a candle for you. But, yeah, welcome to Coveter's Corner. You're going to like what Drew has. A couple things come up in that episode that Drew sent me. Drew is sending me episodes now. I don't have to work as hard. That's nice. Somebody think of me for once. Anyway, let's watch Drew and we're going to talk about a couple things that come up here at the end. Let's go. How's it going, Ken? Uh, my name is Drew. I'm calling you from Washington, D.C. For those of you watching, like and subscribe his channel. I don't, I don't have a channel. Uh, but Ken has been incredibly helpful to me over the last 24 hours, basically, I, I recently discovered his channel and reached out to him with a couple questions I had because it's obvious that he's probably had his hands on a great many more arch tops than I I ever had. Um, and so we got to talking about a couple specific things. I sent him a couple of videos of the instrument and he wanted me to give a brief rundown of what I had because some of the things we were talking about were in conjunction with a video that he's putting out, whatever. Um, so I told him, yeah, of course I do that for you. So basically what we have here is an Epiphone, right? 1953 century Spanish model. So a little bit about myself and this particular instrument here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a player. I'm not a collector. I'm not really interested in any of the concerns that a collector might have. So I'll mention a couple things here that are not original to the guitar. And it definitely has some finish issues, but neither of those things can, are of any concern to me. Um, so I should just throw that out there. I got the instrument to play. So my primary concern was, you know, is it set up well? Does it play well? How is the action? And how is the structural integrity of the instrument? Um, so moving forward, you know, in other words, how much do I have to worry about what I have here? And I'm confident that as it sits now, for the most part, we're doing pretty good. Um, I did take it to a luthier in the area just to have him put eyes on it. Um, nothing stuck out to him as being obviously incorrect or problematic about the instrument. So, you know, that makes me feel comfortable. But I did have some questions and I asked Ken. And so here we are today. So to get into it. Um, yeah, so this, the, the Century model... I don't know the exact date that they went into production. I want to say 1939. Um, they still make them today. Uh, 
as a reissue, obviously. Epiphone was hand-making guitars in uh, New York before they were acquired by Gibson, which occurred sometime in the 50s. I won't bore you with the story of how that went down, um, but suffice it to say, Gibson wanted a piece of the, uh, the upright bass market, which Epiphone had pretty much cornered, and they had some internal squabblings and issues. Um, a lot of people had financial issues post-war, so I'm sure they didn't skirt by that as well, um, and Gibson picked them up. Now people equate Epiphone with being sort of Gibson light. Have whatever opinion about that that you want to have but if there is a model that gibson makes or made there's a probably going to be an epiphone version of it and it's probably not going to be of the same quality standards so that's kind of where epiphone is today but back in the day epiphone was kind of a you know considered to be a, a credible source of musical instruments that being said the century was not top of the line by any stretch of the imagination they had other models out there you know, uh, names like Broadway, Sheridan, um, Zephyr, uh, you know, a few other ones, you know, you can still find those today. Uh, but back in the day, those were kind of, you know, professional grade instruments that had appointments that you would pay for, right? So, you know, elaborate inlays on the headstock and on the neck, um, you know, fancier binding, all that kind of, you know, cosmetic stuff. This was bare bones. This was, this was your instrument. You had some dot markers, position markers, and that was pretty much it. Um, they did start putting pickups on these. Uh, they did start putting pickups in these, I think, at the end of the 40s. So the pickup that's on here is, is original. He did ask me if that was an add-on. I told him, no, that can stop. So <clears throat> starting at the head stop. Uh, if you can see very well, my camera's not the best. Um, no cracking anywhere. This this crazing in the finish is normal. That's not cracks through the wood. That's just cracks through the finish. Um, and if you do some research and find um, any other examples of this particular model, the headstocks look very much the same. Uh, this came with a, an enameled plate that's been hammered onto the, to the top of the headstock there. I think it's kind of sharp. Um, there is a truss rod running through the neck. Obviously, you're going to find that underneath the plate here. These tuning machines are not original. The originals would have had uh, plastic keys. These are Grover tuners. I think this is a definite upgrade, in my opinion, where tuning stability is kind of of paramount importance. I would imagine that if, you know, we're talking about student models in 1953, by today's standards, the stock uh, tuning machines that came with that, that instrument, this instrument, would not have been anything to write home about. So I'm not, you know, I don't really care about that. Uh, original bone nut, no cracking. That looks good to go. Come down here to the neck joint. And I don't see any separation of any kind. Neither did this person that I, I took it to to have. Uh, you know, a second opinion. So, again, don't fix what's not broken. I, I, I am, I'm happy with this neck joint. And I did actually take my phone, uh, stick it through the F hole and take kind of a video of the inside. And I didn't see any um, apparent cracking or separation anywhere in the, the block here. So I think the joint is sound for now. Um, the bracing, Kind of a different story, you know, it was made of uh, cellulose. Over time, that shrinks and breaks down with the, the, the humidity fluctuation. Um, there has been some repair done to this. Like, this is a good example right here. If you can, it'll show up for me. Yeah. Uh, there you go. So, see that crack right there? So, that was basically where they did a repair job on this, uh, this binding, which shrunk. Pulled away from the instrument. Now, there's another place in the, in the guitar where you can kind of see that happening. Uh, right here. See how that binding sticks? Sticks up like that. That should obviously sit flush. So this is in the process of shrinking right now. The remedy for that would be either A, replace all of the binding, or do like they did here. 
and just score it, you know, make a little cut there and then re-glue it so it sits flush against the body. Um, it is what it is. I mean, I have a little miniature humidifier and in the case that I keep it in to kind of mitigate against further damage, but the instrument's almost 70 years old, so, you know, it's to be expected. Uh, so this pickup is the original pickup. It comes in this Bakelite housing. Uh, it's a single coil cover. It doesn't have any adjustable pole pieces. The tone on this is a little bright. Um, it is what it is, you know. Pickups had only been around for, what, 10 years at the time that this was made? 15 years, I don't know. Um, so it was definitely not, you know, a feat of of electrical engineering, but it gets the job done. Um, you know, like I said, I, I like to play jazz, so I'm kind of looking for that warm tone. So I put uh, flat wound strings on it, which I think is more period correct anyway. <coughs> and that's definitely helped with the tone. Uh, these F holes, okay, so talk about like cosmetic appointments and how interested I am in that stuff. This is pretty much, this is the end of the road for me. This is about as, as far as I'll take it. These F holes are, were not white. I painted them white. I like the way it looks. It's my instrument, so who gives a shit? Uh, you know, as the dude said, it kind of ties the room together. That's where my head's at with that. But this is kind of the offending area. This is why I think I got this guitar for such a steal. These old pick guards. I do have the bracket that the pick guard sat, sat on. And if and when I'm interested in doing so, I could have another one fabricated. But um, those old pick guards had a tendency to outgas. They weren't chemically stable. So that's basically what happened. This, and while it was sitting in the case, the, the pick guard basically melted. And that went down onto the finish here. It looks maybe like this is cracked. It's not. This is just has eaten away into the finish. So cosmetically, does it look like a brand new guitar? No. But, you know, I don't know how to play a finish. Nobody ever taught me how to play a finish. So until I figure out how to do that, I don't really care about that at all. Um, let me see here. These knobs are kind of cool. These are also made of uh, Bakelite which is like a popular plastic uh, material that we use for a lot of things at the time. This design is called a carousel knob. These knobs alone are worth a couple hundred bucks. So the fact that the original knobs are a part of this instrument to me is super, super cool. You don't see those a lot. Um, trapeze tail piece. Now getting into sort of the setup stuff, take a look at this bridge. So. I don't know if the base is original or if the whole thing was replaced, but this two pneumatic adjustable bridge was not original. This would have been a, your typical compensated rosewood bridge. This was replaced at some point by the previous owner. I don't mind it. I think it's much more convenient to insinate the guitar with this particular type of bridge setup. So I'm not worried about it. Um, but what Ken was having me look at was basically load distribution on this. Now you can't see right here. There aren't, there is a small gap on this side. Let's run it around. You can see, well, you can't see, you can't see much better. Oh, well, maybe you can see a little bit better. So it sits totally flush on this side, but on this side, there is a little bit of a gap here. So I don't know, I guess that means the bridge is tilting ever so slightly, but the naked eye can't really, I mean, I don't know, I can't really, I can't really tell unless I look hard. And honestly, that could just be a very small portion at the back where this was sanded down and they just took too much off of this back portion of the bottom of the bridge. So it's not, you know, airtight, but you know, I think close enough for government work uh, would kind of describe this bridge. I sent him a picture earlier and he said that the load distribution didn't look right. Um, I think in, upon closer inspection that it's not that bad. Um, the picture I sent him made it look like one of these, one side of this bridge was sitting up way higher than the other one. In which case, yeah, I, I agree with him that there would definitely be a problem because the load 
would be concentrated at the, the, the lower, you know, the side of the bridge that is lowered, right? Because it's taking more of the brunt of the string tension. But this, I think, looks kind of, now that I'm looking at it again, I think it looks I mean, more or less flat. I mean, maybe it's a little bit high on the, the low B side, the low E side, simply because that's how it was set to fine tune the action. Um, again, the neck relief is, is fine. Um, the nut slots are fine. You know, again, I, I'm of the opinion that it's not a huge issue. But that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Nice little piece of history. I will continue to enjoy it. Oh, one weird thing. Um, so I, I sent him a, a cell phone video from inside. I don't know if he's going to mention this or not, but it struck me as weird that there's like a solid piece of bracing on the inside around the, around the instrument where usually you would see that notched kind of kerfing. So I don't know if they use hand card bracing in here or if that kerfing fell off. I really don't think it did because in guitars I've seen where that was starting to happen, it usually chips off in little pieces. So I find it hard to believe that the entirety of that that curved binding would be gone from this instrument. But who knows, maybe he's between when I re recorded this video and when he posts whatever he posts, he'll come up with some sort of an answer for that. But uh, I don't know, that's it. Thanks for letting me share my guitar with you. Mm -hmm. All right, did you see that question about the kerfing inside the guitar? You know what? There's absolutely nothing wrong with that kerfing. In fact, the fact that you can't hardly see it to the untrained eye is really a good thing because it impacts the acoustical values of the guitar. Yeah, smart. Great vocabulary, Ken. I know. Anyway, let's go to the bench real quick and explain why that kerfing looks different than your average cheap arch top. Let's go. Okay, we've got this old Harmony six string here. Got a truss rod, and you've seen this one before um, when we did an episode about kerfing. The top is tore out of this one. And let me try and zoom in here. Oh, other zoom in. There we go. But there's the kerfing right there. And you see this kerfing is put in here. It's got a flat side on the back side, a flat side on the bottom. And it holds the sides to the bottom. And then there's another set of it up here. And you can see that there's cuts in this that allow this stuff to be flexible. So it's kind of like this. You take something that's a little bit flexible. Or even though this yardstick, you can see it bow when you apply pressure to it. Anyway, so you take a piece of wood and you cut slots in it and that's how you make kerfing. Okay, we did an episode about the repair of kerfing on an old arch top, an old archcraft arch top that had been dropped, had a hole in the back and uh, that damage and a couple other cracks tore sections of the kerfing out. Now I'm going to give you a uh, link to that episode right up there right about now and it gets into much more depth than we're going to have here. Now, when I start talking about loading and structure, remember I'm coming from a place of running cranes and uh, conventional crane booms. Those are the ones that, that uh, you, you pin together, not the hydraulic one that goes and does that. We're talking about old conventional cranes. Now, if I take 
my crane boom and I'm picking up something let's pretend this is a crane boom and I'm picking up something heavy and my crane boom rests say right here all the weight of that comes to here so when I'm talking about crane booms and I also uh, understand something about palm trees which are kind of like crane booms in a way and when a tree is very tall and has a 120 foot trunk and you start putting people up at the top up here to prune it and the thing starts loading and stuff and you got abnormalities in the trunk. I know what load isolation is and I'm loosely translating that right now to what sound does and how it gets isolated. And it strikes me very funny that someone would think that when you're strumming strings it's going down into sound holes or F holes and it's hitting all of this with these uneven ridges and all that. That it would kind of seem to me that the sound quality would be affected the less uniform this stuff is. It also dawns on me that say I want to cut this stuff and I can measure it out and I start making my cuts here and here and here and of certain widths to try to make this stuff more bendy uh, than it is. Um, it would strike me that if I can do one side of this material and get this, that it would strike me that I could do the other side and instead of having the lines pointed in like this, where the sound hits them and bounces off and actually gets deadened by those slots, that maybe if those slots were on the inside and this was facing out upside down, that it would still support the side and the bottom, but the lines being inside would be leave a surface that's nice and smooth here so the sound hits it bounces off and doesn't get deadened by all those irregular cuts there and I don't know maybe I'm just crazy or maybe I'm very smart like the people who make better guitars like Drew's guitars and I think that explains why you don't see the lines in there which would make you think that there is no curving. All right wasn't that cool? That makes sense to you. Let's talk about the next issue I want to talk about. And we're not going to get this out of the way here, but did you see, oh, by the way, this is an Aria guitar. Um, it's pretty cool. It's, it's got all the volume controls on uh, the thing, the pick guard, the pick guard. I'll get down to it someday. Got a pretty cool pickup that mounts to the side of the neck so you don't have to drill holes in the body um, but we saw something on Drew's guitar that kind of I, I need to do an episode about this so we're gonna call it high dive bridge high dive bridge look there do you see how high up that bridge is set up with them thumb screws like that do you see how it's leaning forward well guess what we're going to take a baby violin, like the one that's in here, and we're going to talk about bridges and how sound is loaded onto the strings in a violin and on an arch top, and then we're going to see why you really don't want that bridge floating up that high. But that'll be another episode. And... Alrighty then, that's it. Let's call this a day. Don't forget to give me a like and subscribe if you haven't. And one more time, if you want to participate in the Coveter's Corner episode, you get a hold of me by email. My email is at the very end of this episode. And you tell me what you've got and send me some footage. Uh, describe who you are, what you are. I don't need to know about, you know, TMI, all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm just interested in what you have, what you have, so I can covet it. I didn't mean to say that, never mind. Anyway, you're going to send me some footage in this format, shot this way, not this way. It will immediately hit the trash pile. Send it to me this way, and we'll figure out what we can do. And I will, especially if you have a problem or a question, I'll try to figure it out and punch that into the episode. And that way, you can be my partner in people coveting us then. Okay, so that'll be it. Take care of yourself. See you next time.